briefly again, thanks to Karen for uh, working with us on this. We're really enjoying these office hours and find they're always very productive. Just very quickly, I think you guys all know the Open Textbook Network. Um, the Rebus community is a group that Liz works with and I work with, and we are building up a collaborative approach to uh, creating open textbooks. We have about 14, uh, I guess you would call them pilot projects we're working on now, and we'll be um, releasing more uh, software and more thoughts about how to um, systems of collaborating on making open textbooks in the near future. I'm going to drop a link in here. If you don't know about us, come visit. Um, and uh, yay to the Open Textbook Network, and very excited to hear some interesting thoughts about how to keep textbooks up to date from this group here. So over to you, Karen. Okay, thanks, Hugh. And just in case you are not familiar with the Open Textbook Network, we are a community of higher ed institutions in the United States addressing these questions, supporting one another in open programming. And I'm particularly excited about today's topic because the Open Textbook Library is one of our initiatives. And so we think about how to keep that particular collection up to date quite frequently. Lori and I have had a lot of discussions about, about that. So in terms of our format today, our three guests who I will introduce shortly are going to talk somewhere around five minutes, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And then after that, we will open it up to everyone um, and get your questions. I see in the chat that Rachel has kindly asked that um, the rest of the participants introduce themselves and the university they are from. So if you would like to do that in the chat, um, we welcome you to get to know each other that way. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our guests. Um, they are going to talk about how living, uh, excuse me, how open textbooks are living documents with longer lifespans. And we're gonna talk about how we can care for them in the long term and systematically ensure that new additions are created and that, that they don't sort of become stale and just out there in the wide internet universe. So Lori Asoff is from BC campus and she is thinking about these questions. Lori, why don't you tell us how you've been approaching this um, in BC? A quick inter uh, interruption, oh. sorry, Lori um, and Karen, uh, just a note. Uh, I think everyone's on mute here, but if you have questions as people are talking, please post them. Uh, I think we're probably going to do the our guests all in a in a row, and then we'll kind of go back through the chat um, in the right hand bar to uh, pull out the questions and ask them. So we'll organize to ask those questions uh, once we open up for discussion. Okay, sorry, over to all you, right. Lori. My turn. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm in Victoria, British Columbia, and I guess I'm the Canadian representative. Um, I'm manager of open education with BC Campus and the BC Open Textbook Project, and I've been with the project for three or four years and BC Campus for 14. Uh, so when I was looking at this topic, I was thinking both of how to keep textbooks up to date, but also collections, because they go hand in glove. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of the uh, procedures and what we have been doing to uh, address that, um, that uh, situation. So the first thing that we did was we, uh, over the last few years especially, went through our collection and made sure we had a very accurate, concise, and comprehensive record of what was in our collection and uh, a description of each book within the collection. So information such as the date a book was added to the collection, the date it was revised uh, or a new edition was put in, the license type, the source if it was not an original creation or major adaptation that our project funded, uh, the different file types we had because we're very aware of providing editable files, for example, for a book. Uh, so that's the first thing that we have done, and that's an internal document that we maintain. But in terms of the books themselves, there are really uh, two uh, different procedures that we have been following to ensure that books themselves are up to date. One is we are now creating a versioning history page for each book as we are alerted to corrections that might be required for a book. And for that, we have a form called report an error for an open textbook. So that if faculty or staff notice something that needs correcting or changing, they let us know. So those are for minor revisions and corrections. And then we record that 
Uh, we know what was changed, what data was changed, and then we re-upload all the different files related to that book and also provide uh, Simon Fraser University who provides the print on demand uh, copies for us so that they can update the PDF for the book as well. We are, are the books in our collection are static, but we do uh, provide new editions. And Karen and I were having this discussion about whether or not we keep more than one edition of a book in our collection. Uh, it depends if we have done major adaptations, Canadian adaptations for many of the books in the OpenStax collection. In those cases, we will keep the American, original American version and then the Canadian version. But, for example, for Introduction to Sociology, we had the second Canadian edition that was added. So we did remove the first Canadian edition. And when we do that, we're sure to alert uh, the users that we will be doing this. We don't do it in the middle of the term. And we do keep a copy of the original edition in case somebody wants it. Uh, and the fourth thing that I'll, I'll just mention is we we have been polling our faculty and staff in British Columbia. So there are our main stakeholders to ask them where do improvements need to be made, where do updates need to be made, and where the gaps are in the collection. And uh, hand glove with that is a suggestion for the collection form that we have also created and provided to faculty and staff in our province and we ask them to fill that out if they have any suggestions for either current books or for books that they feel are missing or disciplines that don't have enough or any books in the collection. So I think I'm at about six and a half minutes so I'll stop there and hand it over to the next speaker. Thanks Lori. Our next speaker is Shane Ackerud from the University of Minnesota Libraries. Shane, take it away. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Shane. Uh, we've been working with open textbooks for about three and a half years now, um, and mainly using Pressbooks to do that. Um, the way that we have been keeping um, open textbooks up to date so far has been mainly with taking uh, older open textbooks and putting them into Pressbooks. Uh, Pressbooks has been a really good tool to make books, I don't know, uh, more shareable, uh, more remixable, the ability to take the Pressbooks XML and import it into other versions of XML or other versions of Pressbooks across uh, really the world, um, I think has been a big benefit. So how this project started was, um, um, well, you know, you probably all know about uh, the Flat World story of how Flat World changed their licensing so that uh, their books were no longer open, openly licensed. When that happened, uh, the University of Minnesota Libraries, where I work, decided to take a lot of those books and try to um, republish them using our own uh, publishing service within the libraries and using Pressbooks. So, so far we have uh, republished about 26 of those books and they are based on um, uh, hit counts to the Open Textbook Library from the Open Textbook Network. So uh, we took a lot of the most popular books that uh, we knew were getting a lot of traffic on that site and we decided to update them. And by that I mean take a hard look at um, the, the, uh, uh, the content to make sure it's all open uh, and then also a lot of the links in the, uh, the books themselves that uh, the books were pointing at, we needed to update those as well. Uh, a lot of the content we found uh, in the books was not open, especially the images. Uh, so we uh, did a, a big search on each book that we republished for the images that were not open, that would be stock images or that had copyright symbols on them, and we replaced all those. So we're very confident that the books that we've republished are um, completely open, um, which I think is a big benefit. And now we hear from a lot of institutions around the world that are taking those books um, and downloading them, hopefully uh, remixing them or, or uh, reworking them to meet their own needs. Um, unfortunately, we don't, we don't get copies back from institutions that do that, but we, don't, we do know that that happens. Um, 
And, um, and also another way that we've been trying to, I guess, keep the, the books up to date is we, we, we've been asking for supplementary materials that people might have uh, for the books, uh, supplementary materials like PowerPoint presentations or question banks that they may have created uh, for people that use the, the books that we've republished. Um, and so far, we've only had one, one institution give us some content, which... Um, which is great. We get a lot of requests for the content that they've created. So um, we're trying to figure out ways of getting more content for more of the books in terms of supplementary materials. Um, and I just, I would like to also say and encourage people that are thinking about getting into open textbooks that republishing a lot of this existing work that maybe is in danger of disappearing or is getting stale um, is a really great way of diving into the open textbook publishing, I don't know, um, service. Uh, it's especially if you're using Pressbooks, it's a good way of learning the tool um, and, uh, and, and getting to know, I don't know how open textbooks function in general. Um, it's been very beneficial to us. And as a result of our work, we've published um, in-house uh, three University of Minnesota open textbooks, uh, new to open textbooks. And we're working on, I think about five more right now. So it kind of jumpstarted our, our program and it allowed us to uh, to grow our own collection um, within the University of Minnesota so um, that's about that's about it thank you Shane and our third guest is Kristen Munger from SUNY Oswego and she is going to talk about how they care for their open textbooks thanks Kristen Hi there. I'm glad to join in this discussion. So I represent a little bit of a different perspective in that I'm coming at this as an author and as an editor of an open textbook. So I don't have a publishing company or I don't do any of that, but I work with the folks who helped me with the publishing of the open textbook that I did with 10 co-authors. So I wanted to just talk about the SUNY system and the support that I've gotten through as an author as an, and an editor about making sure to keep an eye on as one of the things that we've really had to keep up to date with, which seems like a minor thing, but hyperlinks that through Pressbooks, it's been very nice to be able to go in, look at different notices that we get in order to make sure that the links are up to date because obviously sites move and they crash and they go away. So it's a real ground floor thing, but it's something that's important. And because I have, I was the editor working with so many different co-authors, um, I end up staying in close contact with them because if something crashes or goes away, it, or if it moves, I can usually find where things moved. But if it's something where it's gone or there's been some substantial change, then that requires actually going in and, and trying to do something about replacing it with an equal site or even like a minor revision or rewrite for a section of it because of that lack of update or because of something moving that can no longer be accessed. So um, I've worked with Allison Brown, who is here. Hi, Allison. So we, we've done some work that way. Um, I'm trying to think of some, some other points. Like one thing that I also want to say coming at this, I think from a little bit of a different angle is one of the best ways to keep textbooks alive and up to date. Well, maybe I'll, I'll make the point that re revisions are like this discrete process where you have an edition and then you have another edition, and another edition. And I, I think what is nice about open textbooks is it's continuous. It's no longer discrete. But at what point are you flopping from one edition to another edition? When, when you have that much flexibility, I think that it really takes on, um, it, it's good but it also takes on where are you in the process and it, does this constitute a new edition and how do you label those things? The, the biggest point that I wanted to make that probably isn't in line with the, the publishing piece, but the best way to update content in open textbooks is to have the people who are using them and adopting them know that they can do that. So once you adopt something and you're adapting it, that you really do, if it's truly open or it's nearly completely open, then you as the user have so much flexibility. If there's something that's wrong, if there's something that becomes outdated, you personally can do this. It doesn't change what's in Pressbooks or wherever the, um, the, the system that's showing the textbook to the publish, through the publishers for downloading. But 
keeping in mind that once you adopt something, if you have full flexibility, you can make some of those changes. And then it's so helpful to let authors like me and the publishers know if there are errors or something that needs to be changed. That's the great feedback that we can get to then make things stay much more alive. I think it, I, I've heard of um, systems like this and even individual textbooks, it's really care and feeding about how we go about this work. So I, I want to make sure that I include the empowerment of the people who are actually ad adopting and adapting the resources, that they have the influence also about making sure things are up to date minute by minute in the courses that they use, teach where they're using the resources that are available. Thanks very much, Kristen, for your perspective. And I appreciate, too, um, defining some of those terms, like when we're talking about a revision versus a new edition, and um, also sort of this idea of a, a book of record versus the locally um, adopted and potentially adapted version. Um, when thinking about the OTL or BC Campus Library, there's the challenge of trying to still keep an up-to-date book of record, knowing that they're being adapted you know, everywhere. And then, of course, there's also subject area considerations. Um, some textbooks need really timely examples from current events. And so this really becomes a, a pretty complex issue. And so I, I appreciate that all of us are thinking sort of at different levels, from the author level to the library level to the publisher level, how it could work. In terms of the open textbook library, I will say that we um, have been thinking we have about 400 books in the collection now and one idea we have in terms of sort of caretaking or caring for these textbooks is potentially giving publishers direct access to the book record so that you know that becomes part of the workflow updating the description updating the most recent publication dates um, if ancillary materials are added um, I don't know if this is going to be rolled out anytime soon, but I think that's, that's one idea that we're working on so that people have more local control. So I'm hoping that I can put one guest in this uh, call on the spot, and that's Alina Slavic. I noticed she's here from OpenStax. And Alina, I was thinking you may have some um, uh, thoughts or processes on this topic that you could share from the OpenStax perspective. Would you be willing to talk for a couple minutes about that? Definitely. I'm happy to talk about that. So uh, with OpenStax, uh, we have actually recently rolled out a new and improved errata tool. So this is accessible via our website. Um, it's accessible via each book's page on the website. So I can link you to an example of that. And this allows for a public list of any errata that have been submitted. And it also allows the person who submitted the errata, but also any, anyone else from the public to monitor the status of this report and see how we've addressed this report. Um, and as far as the question of revisions versus additions, um, we release, we consider it a revision when it's primarily just errata changes. Um, a new addition would be a much more significant undertaking for us. Um, so far, we have released a second edition of Introduction to Sociology 2E. Um, it had major content updates, um, content moving around. Uh, I believe it had a new chapter as well. Um, so, and we also consider if, if a book has had enough errata changes that it even merits a new revision because we do understand that it does present a little bit of a burden to adopters when they want to, um, when they want to move to the new revision. And so if there aren't significant errata that have uh, corrections that have been made, um, we will just, we will use the same uh, PDF year to year. And uh, we also release release notes that detail the changes from one PDF to the next so that if we have released a new revision of the book, you can see exactly what's changed from one year to the next. Super, thank you so much for, for sharing your processes with us at OpenStax. So there has been a lively discussion and uh, introductions in the chat. If I'm not mistaken, and someone correct me if I am, it looks like the first question here is for Shane from Michelle Reed at UT Arlington. Shane, how and where are you sharing or planning to share the supplementary materials that you talked about? And uh, Michelle is thinking about student access and trying to control 
um, student access when maybe you don't want them to have it. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> that was a concern for us too. Uh, first of all, we put on each of our open textbooks um, a, a page uh, that said, please share your supplementary materials. Um, and then gave you know people that were reading a description of of how to share and why they would want to share and that kind of thing. So we put that on all of our books. Um, like I said, we did get um, an institution, the University of uh, Southern Georgia, I think it was, that uh, supplied with us um, a question bank for understanding media and culture. So we had to think about okay, how do we how do we um, get this out there? What we decided on, I think the easiest solution was we put it in Google Drive and then we prohibited access for anybody to see it unless they requested access. Um, and we made it clear that when you request access, you'll need to prove to us uh, that you are a faculty member or instructor um, at your institution. So when somebody makes a request, um, they either do that, they either prove that, uh, I can look up their email address and find out who they are. Um, I can also, uh, and I had to do this just yesterday, I had to write somebody and say, could you send me some information on whether or not you're a faculty member? So, you know, I could see that that process could get a little cumbersome if we have a lot of supplementary material for a lot of uh, open textbooks in the future. But it is, um, I don't know, something that I'm willing to do just to learn more about this. Um, get some more supplementary material and then and grow grow the service from there. But um, basically the answer to the question is put it in Google Drive and then block access to it and, and make people request that access. Thanks, Shane. I wonder too about Prula. I don't know if there's anyone in the call who's had experience with Prula, but we've been um, looking at that as a possible tool for um, developing open ancillary materials, particularly test bank questions. How do you spell uh, that? Um, it's P-R-O-O-L-A. It's out of the University of Nebraska. And the University of Ohio, Ashley Miller there has been um, working with them on a project too. So uh -huh. um, there could be potential there. Thank you, someone put it in the chat. And it looks like uh, the Rebus community, according to Zoe, is also going to trial it for one of the pilot projects. So we'll all have to keep talking together to see how it goes as we give it a, give it a run. Okay, um, Linda Fredrickson had a question about how often um, authors check hyperlinks. And I think this question is for Kristen, but I'll go ahead and expand it and say, you know, do we create timelines for checking in and um, potentially revising or keeping textbooks up to date? Would it be a summer project? Um, is that too crazy, especially if you have a big collection? I'm interested in people's thoughts on um, potentially creating caretaking timelines. And I keep using the word caretaking. I can't come up with a better one. Um, but I think it captures sort of the essence of, of what we're trying to do. But if someone has a word they like, let's, let's go for it. So timelines. Lori, do you have a system, a timeline? Uh, I was just thinking. Um, we, we do not yet. And I will say that working in this area, it really is a work in progress. And we're uh, developing procedures and systems as we go. Um, and this sort of thing has been on our radar. So I would say, no, we don't have a system right now. And we primarily correct dead links and make other corrections as people report them to us. So uh, that's a good point. It's, you know, something to definitely keep an eye on. Yeah, we're in the same place with the Open Textbook Library. We hear of revisions. Um, we try to point to the most recent edition and, and not necessarily the most recent revision. Um, sometimes when we get into the, the weeds with these questions, it helps me to think about the big picture, which is the Open Textbook Library's role to connect faculty with publishers. And so um, the publishers may have the most up to the minute um, revision, but hopefully we're pointing to the right edition. Alina, what about at OpenStax? Do you guys have sort of a systematic process or timeline where you continually check in and update textbooks? And is this still referring specifically to links? It could, or it could refer to sort of a bigger, a bigger picture overhaul or evaluation. Okay. Um, 
Well, I'll first talk about links. So when we are pointing to an external site, we use a redirect. And so I'll paste an example in the chat. Um, it still says OpenStax College, so we'll be updating to, uh, to just OpenStax. But how this helps us is when we need to change the target destination. So, you know, the content has moved. Hopefully it's still available. It's, the URL has just changed a bit. We can update that internally. And the content itself does not have to be updated because it can, it can stay with that OpenStax link, that redirect link. And also we have a program that it's called a, a fighter. So it crawls the links. Um, I believe it runs monthly. And if it, if it tries to visit the link and it gets a 404, um, it can let us know and then we can investigate. Sometimes the site is just down temporarily and it had happened to be down when the program ran, but other times the content really has moved um, or we need to rewrite the feature because we need to use some other kind of external content. Um, and as far as more general reviews of our textbooks, um, we're, we're constantly considering which textbooks might be eligible for a second edition. Um, certain content areas like economics, uh, microbiology, where there might be more substantive changes uh, more frequently. Um, and I will say also on economics, we do update the FRED information so that um, uh, that economic data as it comes out every year. So I can, this is Chris again. I, I could talk a little bit more about some of the, the hyperlinking and I, I think Pressbooks must use a lot of the same tools when it comes to crawling and looking for broken links. And I still am in touch with the folks at Milne Library who did the publishing of the book through Pressbooks. And so sometimes I'll get an email if I'm not up on it where there's broken links and I haven't checked recently, then I'll get an update that there are some links I need to check out and try to resolve. And I can even access um, and, and tinker under the hood and go and correct those on my own because of my collaboration with the publisher who's given me access to Pressbook. So as an author, I can have some responsibility and, and bear some of the burden of trying to figure that out, especially if the link hasn't just moved and can be redirected, but there needs to be some sort of adjustment in the test related to what's then missing. Thank you both. Um, this, this idea of an author continuing to um, check in on an open textbook, I think is a really powerful one too. And something we've thought about as we launch publishing initiatives, for example, suggesting that authors um, commit to caring for the open textbook they're funded to create for let's say five years and outlining what that would look like so that authors kind of have, have a plan for checking in every year. This isn't something that we've implemented at this point. It's something we're looking at um, as part of a new initiative with our publishing cooperative. But I'd be curious, um, the people in this call and other members in the Open Textbook Network, if they've tried something similar um, so that it's, it's a longer term um, commitment or maybe even if that's realistic. So thank you everyone for keeping your questions coming. The next one in our chat is from C. Holland, asking about how an instructor could ensure students are using the most up-to-date version of a textbook. And I think um, actually Kristen touched on this, that because uh, you can adapt it to your own needs, it can be as up-to-date um, as you want it to be, assuming you have a flexible file type or are working in press books. Um, but you can also check back directly with the author, or the publisher or the open textbook library. Um, but I think, you know, that's kind of the, the beauty and the challenge of an open textbook, perhaps. Um, or maybe it's just the same way that you would ensure a traditionally published textbook is up to date. Any other thoughts on that, people who would like to chime in? Uh, I know in British Columbia, we do leave that up to each uh, faculty member. Um, who uh, adapts a book. So what we are finding is uh, you can publish or post open textbooks, but the customization the, and the adaptation is 
I think even more important than we realize, not only regionally, but per institution, per course, and per instructor. So w when we are talking about open pedagogy, we stress that it is up to them. They do have this responsibility. They do have this power to ensure that the material um, aligns with their learning objectives and that they keep it current. And often what we hear back from faculty is the ability to do that is, is really appreciated. So it is really a, a different way of looking at the, uh, the teaching material, I think. It's, you know, we have to keep remembering we're used to static textbooks, but these aren't static, even though in our collection we do keep static uh, versions. Uh, once they get out into the real world, they are very um, uh, flexible. Thanks, Lori. So Carmen is asking about a versioning system for printing PDFs and adaptations when they first issue their open textbook. And then she has a, a, a leaflet manual issued by government agencies. Carmen, I need you to um, explain your, your example a little bit better if you could. I don't have that point of reference. Are you still there? Can you unmute? Anyone um, understand Carmen's question? It's just a little bit up. Has anyone built a versioning system for PDF printing and adaptations when they first issue their open textbook? I'm thinking of the old leaflet manual systems used for old government agency manuals and loose leaf publications. And then I think Carmen might be referring to sort of modular design. This includes page numbers specific to chapters instead of continuous paging. I'm not exactly sure what Carmen is talking about, but it is um, an issue that we've been thinking about at the University of Minnesota, the idea that um, we need a easier way of, of versioning. Um, and, and I agree with Lori, one, one thing that we're going to start doing is the same thing that she's doing, and that is putting in a, um, a versioning history page on each of our books. Um, but it would be nice if Pressbooks did that automatically, and I wouldn't mind hearing from Hugh. I know that other people have asked him about that, about Pressbooks' ability. But before he goes into that, I was going to say that we are planning on using the PDF versions as archived versions that we are going to put into our institutional repository. So when we make a new edition, we'll probably have, obviously, the new edition be highlighted on our, you know, open textbook page, that, that initial record page. Uh, but we'll probably have links back to our institutional repository that will have um, um, versions of the uh, the older PDFs uh, for the older editions um, that people can still access. Um, I can jump in and comment on Shane's question there about versioning and maybe, um, yeah, about versioning. So uh, Pressbooks has, uh, is in halfway through a, development project funded by eCampus Ontario, and we're working with uh, Ryerson University on that. Um, and we had a few broad goals, but the, the core one was to make more formal cloning of Pressbooks books easier. So currently what you have to do is export an XML and then import it into Pressbooks. Um, what we've done is exposed the WordPress core API without getting technical details. What that means is that we are just polishing off a release of a feature that will allow you to point at a Pressbooks URL and say, please pull this whole thing into Pressbooks and it will happen uh, pretty seamlessly. Um, or at least that's the plan. Part of that work around cloning means we have to start thinking about this uh, because that means that if someone, for instance, at University of Ohio has published a book and someone in uh, University of uh, Minnesota wants to adapt that, it becomes very easy to get that into Pressbooks, whereas before it was doable, but there was a certain clunkiness to the process. So that's going to be formalized both in the back end and also we're going to uh, have allowances or affordances for that in the front end so that when you're on a 
Pressbooks webpage, Pressbooks book web webpage, there will be somehow an indication that you can clone that book if you wish to. Um, as part of that, we know that controlling version con or version control is an important piece of this. So we haven't quite got to that yet, but our general um, plan is to have as part of the metadata pointing to where the original copy of this book was. Um, so there would be a trail back to the, the origin of the book. Um, and that origin should I think whether you're the third, if you're sort of four clones down in, in the root should go back to the very original. Um, and then I think this notion of formalizing some kind of history in a web page and a PDF page is, is a good idea. So at the very least, you can track where it's come from. Um, and then I think it will be certainly out of scope uh, of the current work we're doing with Ryerson and eCampus. But the idea is that once you start having that information, Again, using the new API, it would be very easy to generate diffs, so to see what's changed between one version and another. Huh. Very, very easy in quotation marks like all dev projects. Um, so uh, the main point there is that a lot of these ideas are starting to happen at scale uh, or at a better scale with Pressbooks. Um, and, you know, we've been constrained over the years, so f it was nice to get a, a chunk of dev resources coming from that eCampus project. So we're hoping to uh, continue our work to try to gather around the people who are using Pressbooks open source to, to get a clearer idea of a roadmap for what people need and find better ways to, to fund the development there. So that's all in progress. And, and over back, back to you guys now. Sorry, no, it's great. These are all um, developments I think we look forward to. Um, and thank you, Carmen, for your question and for the example that you've put in the chat um, and this idea of mix and match modular systems for, for open textbooks. And then Anita Walls mentioned, um, mentioned Noba as, as a publisher who uses this particular format, but that they're not necessarily designed for version control. So, um, C. Holland, I had a question just a little bit earlier in the chat. Are static versions that we were talking about earlier archived in your institutional repository or on a platform or what? Um, so I'll, I'll start answering that um, from the perspective of the open textbook library. Um, we do keep a dark archive thanks to a partnership with Colorado State University Libraries. This is in DSpace. This really, though, is um, in case something should disappear. Um, at the start of the office hour, Shane mentioned the, um, the flat world uh, example. And so this was on our mind um, in creating a dark archive and also to assure faculty adopters that there is a backup out there. Um, we all know things can disappear on the internet. Um, so anyone else want to talk about their archive or um, where the static files are, but uh, I welcome you. Um, that is what I hear mostly from um, members is that they go into the institutional repository and then for the open textbook library, they're also backed up in a dark archive. So uh, with BC campus, uh, again, Karen and I've talked about this. Um, currently we uh, store those records internally. We haven't made them public, but they are available uh, for individuals who do want a copy. So that's how we're doing it currently. Okay, are there other questions out there or um, ideas that you guys would like to discuss? I think I've hit on everything in the chat, but I welcome more. Or have we come to our natural conclusion? <laughs> efficient says Hugh, we are an efficient group. I will take that. <laughs> well, I'll take that. Um, maybe, maybe I'll uh, jump in, Karen. I think um, uh, it seems to me that this issue, you know, well, I guess there are a lot of issues which are, are sort of fundamental challenges for the open textbook universe. 
Um, and as we think in the Rebus context of not just collaboration, but what is a publishing system that is going to be sustainable and scalable in the long term, this question of how to keep things updated uh, is going to be critical for our whole universe, uh, all of us, I think, um, because, you know, just like things like the peer review and the qual quality assurance, um, you know, if, if a textbook was good five years ago, it doesn't mean it's necessarily good now. And that's, you know, if we don't address this, it's kind of going to kill this movement if we don't figure out how to do this well. So j just to say that it's, you know, in the pantheon of all the 7 million problems that, that um, we hope to bring people together to, to help solve, this is kind of one of the things in the Rebus context that we'd like to be working on. And perhaps it, uh, for those who don't know, I also happen to be the founder of Pressbooks. And what's very nice is that what we're doing at Rebus, which is about kind of the publishing process, is being tracked very closely by what's happening in the Pressbooks development direction because open textbooks are really the most interesting and best use case we've seen for Pressbooks, even though we have some others. Um, so that means that, that both from a community perspective on the Rebus side, this is a very interesting problem that we're thinking about. And from the technical side on the Pressbooks level, it's, it's important as well. So um, uh, yeah, I guess that's it. That's all I want to say. I think this is a very important issue. And I think it's so helpful as we're thinking about this to have people who've got experience and background in doing this to, to help all of us think about how to, how to do this in, um, in the future. So kudos to you all and thank you. Thanks, Hugh. Um, while you were uh, making those connections between Pressbooks and Rebus and our community, we received another question. Um, this is a general question for any of our three presenters. Do you find that your institutions recognize authoring open textbooks in the same light as traditional textbooks? So Steve, I, I assume this is related to tenure and promotion. Uh, I know in British Columbia for the very first time, and Hugh, you might be aware of this at UBC, University of British Columbia, uh, part of a faculty's tenure track and as part of consideration for promotion, OER, is now um, an item on that list. So that was quite a exciting a feather. Yeah, yeah. So there, it's a you know it's a very prestigious university and um, great that they're leading the way on that. And what's exciting for our project too, we have a new member of our team who works at UBC. So we're learning a lot about that institution, and uh, we can uh, continue to work with them on open textbooks. Um, maybe I can just digress a little bit too uh, from my answer to Steve. I want to say, you know, all these issues I think we've all been thinking about for a long time. And as you say, Hugh, we've got 7 million of them to consider. What I have found a little more recently in my work in the last 9 to 12 months is I, you know, I do hear frustration from faculty who are really, really delving into press books. And for our project, we really are entering the operational um, phase of uh, dealing with open textbooks. You know, we're victims of our own success and we're getting a lot of faculty and staff who are interested. So when I get a, a frustrated faculty member saying, why doesn't this work this way? The very first thing I do is I call and I say, thank you for calling. I love to hear problems and I love to hear from struggling faculty and it just decompresses the tension immediately. Uh, and I try to take note of what the issues are and I put them in, we have our own little version of the press books guide. Um, and I do refer to what I call big press books uh, support guide as well. But just to note to people that we are aware of this issue. And so if you can say it out loud and, and tell the people you're working with, we are aware of it, it hasn't been solved yet, but then it educates them as well. And so they can see the enormity of the task and that uh, the way we're looking at learning materials has really, really changed. It's like I said earlier, not static, but it's fluid. And how do you work with that? Uh, I don't know if anybody is, you, you gotta get used to that freedom it's like I look at our younger son who's 23 and he's got the world at his, his 
feet, but that can be overwhelming. <laughs> so just getting used to this new culture we live in uh, takes a little bit. Can I speak a little bit to the tenure and promotion thing too, just as coming from somebody who was an author who was going through the tenure and promotion process while my textbook was being published. So um, I wasn't privy to the discussions about me and how much the textbook counted versus um, some of the other efforts and, and publishing and research that I was doing. But I, what, I, what I did, I mean, I think in most institutions, people have to kind of document and reflect on what they're doing, their accomplishments, their activities and things like that. And we're really in uncharted territory in some ways. So I, I took it upon myself in my, we call it a retention folder or a, a tenure folder um, to educate people about what I went through in the peer review process and um, securing what we did, the different the, the way that it mapped on to sort of the accomplishments and excellence that people might be recognized for in more traditionally commercially available publishing endeavors. And in talking with people like my dean or other people who have acknowledged my work, the textbook did feature prominently. I don't know that it was a, a decision point one way or the other, but once people understood the process and the value of it, um, the feedback that I that I got about it seemed to be that it was valued and there's much more interest in OER in general because if you start talking about it and explaining to people, no, it's not just free stuff that anybody can rip off the internet, that, that there's, a, there's a, a method to what's going on and a real vision and this is a movement. And so it, each time we do something like this, it gives an opportunity to educate the people around us about the value. And once they understand it, they're likely to value our contribution more as well. Thanks for your perspective. Shane, do you want to talk at all about how um, open textbook authors fare at the University of Minnesota? Yeah, sure. Um, the open textbook authors that we've had here have all been tenured already. Um, so it hasn't really played a role in their tenure process. Um, the untenured faculty that we speak to uh, about publishing an open textbook and they do come to us about that, they usually ask about support. Like, what kind of funding can you give me to do this? And unfortunately, we can't offer as much funding as a traditional publisher um, if they can get a traditional publisher to publish their, their work. Um, and so that, that, is, that is a challenge. The, uh, the textbooks that we have published though, the faculty that uh, have published through us, um, we have heard from them saying that the reach of the textbooks have been a lot wider um, and more immediate uh, because they have put it in an open textbook fashion. And that's a story that we uh, are trying to tell um, all faculty here, uh, non-tenured inclu including, um, that your reach can be, can be much more um, um, impactful and immediate uh, going the open textbook route and I think that message is resonating uh, more and more so we have we have open textbooks that we're working on right now and we'd obviously like to do more we're not hard up for um, for work in that area uh, but we'd like people to think about uh, open textbooks as a new way of of extending the reach of their scholarship so Thank you. And just to um, comment on one of your comments, you know, I think there's this idea that traditional textbook authors are um, handsomely paid for their work, which is sometimes the case, um, and other times not so much. For example, when I've had um, conversations about a, a, a good healthy stipend for writing a textbook, I have used the $5,000 number in the uh -huh. past. And many people have told me there are many, many traditional textbook authors who would be delighted to receive that amount of funding and don't see that from, from royalties. So it, it can really depend. Um, I also am acquainted with um, a faculty author who wrote sort of the, the, um, the number one textbook on business analytics and um, that is doing really well and I don't think any of us could compete. So I think we have time for one more question that I see here um, from Katya. If any of you were to give faculty pointers about OER and someone asked you whether they could create OER without any funding, how would you describe their options? 
So it sounds like Katya's question is, um, maybe there's someone who's excited about making OER, um, but they don't have uh, funding for it. How would you support them? And I'll go ahead and, and suggest Katya, there's a couple of guides the Open Textbook Network has created where members share case studies um, and examples of how they have supported faculty in their programs. So you might wanna check those out and um, benefit from their experiences. Is there anyone in the call who would like to, to address that question also? I'll, uh, I'll jump in if no one else wants to. Um, so what we've been building at Rebus is, so we've been doing a lot of hands-on work with projects, but all of that has two roles. One is to help the projects themselves, but more importantly, it's to develop a clear and transparent process and some tools to, to help support the creation of open textbooks. So how do you go about managing it? What are the things that have to happen? How do I get people on board to help me out? Um, and so we're not quite sure when this will be available to the universe, but our intention at Rebus is to have a platform that um, kind of builds in uh, an ease of managing the creation of an open textbook project so that um, any grouping of people who either know each other or don't can come together and, and work on something. So uh, answering the question that Katya asked is really the, the uh, I guess, driving force behind what we're doing mm -hmm. uh, at Rebus. While we do expect to continue to support projects that do have funding, the idea is that the platform is such that people who don't have funding can still um, get, uh, get their projects done. And in fact, we certainly are working currently on a number of projects that don't have any uh, support behind them. Yeah. But that means that you have to have people who are willing to do it anyway, right? So, uh, so people's motivations are, are uh, you know, people have, there has to be a motivation to do that. Um, and we've certainly found lots of different reasons why people are motivated, but um, someone has to be deciding it's something they want to spend their time on. Thanks, Hugh. And I think we can actually squeeze in uh, another question before the top of the hour. So Linda commented that UBC's work to get OER added to tenure and promotion plans is monumental. And she's looking for a little backstory on how that came to be. Lori, do you have um, the saga? I'm sorry, I don't. I just know, I just know about it, but I'm not quite sure how it came to be. But you know what, I will ask around and I don't know if that doesn't help anybody today. But um, yeah, you're right. You know, sometimes changes are made by um, uh, demonstrating and uh, setting an example. Yeah. Uh, can I just go back a little bit to uh, payment and support while writing a book? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people know I was a writer in my previous life, and I can certainly say that writing books, you don't, you're not going to make your millions. It's rare that somebody actually makes money on that. Most authors get paid in advance, which you have to pay back to the publisher. And in my day, it was ten or $15,000 for a year plus worth of work, plus the marketing and everything that went into it. Um, but what we've done with our OER grants and ancillary development grants is we are trying to ask the institutions to offer more support. So we ask for in-kind support. So it doesn't have to be money, but as we continue to work with institutions, um, they are stepping up and providing the copy editing, um, research, uh, you know, so items like that. So it doesn't have to be cash per se, but if, or they can get release time. Uh, to do the writing, because that's what we see faculty authors struggling with is finding the time to do this. And I find people totally underestimate what is what it is required to write a book. <laughs> it's a lot of indeed. You know, yeah. So uh, educating people one and then um, as the changes are happening, seeing if the institutions will step up. Thanks, Lori. And so we put um, a link to the story in the chat while you were talking, so there might be a little more background at that link. Thank you. And I will also echo Caleb's comments that sometimes you just start writing. Um, 
And I think that's what we're all doing here. We're, we're starting to make, we're figuring it out. Um, there's a lot of people who have found great solutions. It's an exciting time with lots of rewards and lots of challenges. And that's one reason why, why we're all here together. So I would like to thank our three guests, Lori, Shane, and Kristen for joining us. Thank you for sharing your experience and your perspectives. And as a reminder, this will be on the Rebus community YouTube in the near future. And I hope to see you all, um, perhaps some of you in Minnesota in a couple weeks at Summer Institute and Summit. And if not, see some of you in the next open office hours um, where we are right now. So I think that's it, unless Hugh, Liz, or anyone else has closing thoughts. I wish you all a wonderful Wednesday.